The following podcast is a presentation of This is Infamous. Listener discretion is advised. What's going on, ladies and gents? Welcome back to the IWC. That's right. After a long, self-imposed hiatus of podcasting and talking wrestling, in front of a live mic, I, your host, Billy Donnelly, am reviving, am rejuvenating, am reanimating the Intelligent Wrestling Conversation Podcast. I didn't know this day would ever come. I really didn't. I didn't know that I would bring this show back one day. I didn't know that I would have the drive, the motivation, the passion, the love, the intensity to bring this show back one more time. Or to podcast again, for that matter. I was kind of burnt out. Kind of unmotivated. Kind of not wanting to do anything. In the past few days sort of stoked that fire inside of me one more time, once again. And it all really came down to WrestleMania weekend. Made the trip to Orlando, Florida with my young little son for his technically second WrestleMania, even though he didn't really remember the first one. So really his first WrestleMania experience, this one being my sixth now. And I got to tell you, I I wasn't really excited heading into WrestleMania weekend. And there were some things I was excited about. But the WrestleMania card itself, on paper, wasn't really doing much for me. Watching uh, episodes heading into WrestleMania of Raw and SmackDown wasn't really doing much for me. I was a little bit down on going to WrestleMania this year. In fact, having purchased all of my tickets and, 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 and gotten set up, with my accommodations months ago, I was starting to feel a little bit of a damper on my WrestleMania weekend. And usually WrestleMania weekend is the weekend that I look forward to uh, one of the most sought-after weekends of the year. It's like my Christmas. I like Christmas. It's probably like Christmas and then like WrestleMania, like underneath it. And then maybe like Earth Day. And 4th of July, because there's fireworks. But it's usually... I mean, WrestleMania is one of those things uh, now that has become an, an annual event for me. I mean, it's an annual event for everyone, uh, technically. But every single year now, WrestleMania is one of my things. I make the trip now, year after year, to go to where WrestleMania is and attend... The WrestleMania events, the festivities, the circumstances surrounding WrestleMania. Years ago, I had a choice, really. I could have chosen to go to Comic-Con and had like that be my thing or to go to WrestleMania. I I, I was limited budget-wise that I could only pick one. And I chose for it to be WrestleMania. And now that's my yearly thing. And so this year, not really all that excited. I was more excited to be able to go and share it with my son. That, that's what I was most excited about going to WrestleMania for. I've experienced WrestleMania before. He didn't really. So I was more excited to sort of bring him into the fold and have him be excited. And sort of be excited by proxy. Because he was super psyched. And... Really, as a result of this weekend, being in Orlando for WrestleMania 33 is what has now prompted and provoked me to fire up the mic, get the recording going again, and podcast once more. And I really owe it all to you. If you're listening out there to you, if you were out in Orlando this weekend to you, to the people who were in Orlando, Florida attending WrestleMania. Because 
as much as I don't like wrestling fans at times, and I'm not even talking about, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not going to say marks in like a, a negative way because we're all marks to a point. Smart marks are the ones that really piss me off. So those are the ones that I usually take the most issue with. But, and I have found over time that wrestling fans can be the absolute worst. They are some of the, they can be much, much like any fandom. But because I'm in the wrestling community, wrestling fans are, are the ones that I'm exposed to the most. But wrestling fans can be among some of the worst people at times. And what I found here heading into WrestleMania weekend, as I normally do, and this is why I'm broadcasting once again, is that when the community comes together, when the fandom comes together for a common goal, a common cause, when they're sharing their love and their passion for what goes on Inside that squared circle. What goes on between those ropes? I love it. I mean, I absolutely love it. I love being around people who love it. I love discussing it with people who love it. I love geeking out with people who love it. And they make it worthwhile. They make it what. They make it worth going to WrestleMania every year. They make it worth suffering through a hurrah when it's really bad or all, you know, 12 hours of WWE content uh, on a weekly basis. They make it worth it because then we all come together. And it's not even always about the wrestling. It's about the atmosphere, the vibe, the community environment That has been fostered for this love of professional wrestling. Or sports entertainment, if you really want to call it that. And so, look, I've been down on wrestling for months. You know, I stopped regularly watching it for a while because it felt not just like a chore, but I just wasn't enjoying it. I wasn't having a good time watching it. It felt like an obligation A lot of it wasn't very good. And I was suffering through it for what? To podcast and bitch about it? I mean, I'm still going to do that to a degree. But I think as you'll see moving forward, sort of with the relaunch, the reboot of this podcast is... It's going to be a little bit different moving forward. Number one, for my own sanity. Not Eric Young's sanity, but for my own own peace of mind, my own mental health. I can't just sit and watch Raw and SmackDown and NXT and 205 Live and then maybe some Ring of Honor, maybe some Impact Wrestling, and then sit here and critique it for you for an hour every single week. I can't do it. It's too much. There will be different things that we bring up, different things that I find to be important that we will raise as issues here on this show and discuss. But this is not just going to be sort of a a recap and review show. This is a fresh start. So we're not going to be doing that moving forward. Here on this particular show, I'm going to talk about WrestleMania weekend. I'm going to talk about NXT TakeOver. And then moving forward, especially during the pay-per-views, yeah, we'll recap some of those shows. We'll talk about the high points, low points, what worked, what didn't work, uh, as as sort of uh, maintaining business to a degree. But moving forward, I don't want to sit here and be like, all right, and then in the second quarter hour of the 9 o'clock hour of Monday Night Raw, I fell asleep for five minutes uh, during another Stephanie McMahon lengthy promo. I don't, I don't want to do that. That's not what the point of this show is. I got, I got bigger ideas and bigger things that I want to be able to discuss in terms of wrestling, uh, the booking, how it works, creativity, uh, a lot of different, the art, really. Not to, not to infringe on Cole Cabana's gimmick there. 
But but a lot of different things about wrestling is what I want to talk about moving forward. And so, yeah, so so really uh I was I was sort of revived with wrestling here on this WrestleMania weekend, hanging out with so many cool people, talking to so many cool people, getting to see uh, new friends and old over WrestleMania weekend, and just really being inspired to once again podcast and talk wrestling. So, yeah, so just to get that out of the way, it's been a rough few months uh, with me and wrestling right now. Um, but WrestleMania weekend has sort of brought me back to wanting to discuss it. And now that we're going to sort of relaunch the IWC here, uh, it's going to be a different animal moving forward. So, um, so for anybody who used to listen in, in, in the past, uh, if you liked what you liked, you know, there, there will be taste of that along the way. Um, if you didn't like it, maybe, maybe now's your chance to give it an, another, another run. Because maybe you said, hey, I, I already watched three hours of Raw and I saw what it was and I don't really want to hear anymore about it because <sighs> just enough. And I get it. Look, I get that. I understand. After watching Raw for three hours, I barely wanted to talk about it for an hour, <laughs> okay? Now, and plus, once, like I said, it's, it's a lot of content to consume. Just Period just a lot of wrestling you need to take a break every once in a while i think the people inside the wwe need to take a break from the wwe sometimes in order to sort of freshen up their product and really get their finger back on the pulse of pop culture but so moving forward here with the iwc uh it's going to be a little bit different show moving ahead um we will talk about more than than the wwe too got some ideas Make sure we talk about Ring of Honor. Make sure we're talking about some of the indies. Make sure we're talking about Impact Wrestling to the detriment of some of you. Um, but but to see what else is going on out there just of just then what's happening on Monday Night Raw or what's happening on SmackDown. So uh, so that that's that's sort of my my pledge to you moving forward and sort of my explanation as far as where I've been, where we're going, and why now it's coming back. All right. So welcome, welcome back. And and I thank you very much for coming along for this ride. You know, and I got to thank the people out there who said, hey man, why don't you podcast anymore? Or hey, it'd be cool if you fired that back up again. Because it made me think, or believe at least, that this show does something for somebody out there. And if it does, then good for, good for all of us, Right? I know the wrestling podcast landscape has been sort of crowded uh, as of as of late, and to try and cut through all that noise is a little bit difficult. But you know what? We're going to try and do something a little bit different, okay? Moving forward, and, and hopefully that 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 retains your interest and uh, and brings uh, some more people into the fold here on this particular show. So hopefully all of us enjoy things moving forward, and we don't get so burnt out on wrestling as has been the case uh, in the past few months. So look, so with that said, let's talk about WrestleMania weekend, okay? Let's talk about everything that's going on. Uh, in, in particular, what I'm going to talk about mostly, I'll talk about WrestleMania. I definitely want to talk about NXT TakeOver. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the Hall of Fame because I wasn't there. Um, but I but I did talk to some people who were there. I haven't watched it. I'll get into my reasons why in a little bit uh, as far as the Hall of Fame. But I think sort of the motif around the Hall of Fame is is fitting with the rest of some of what happened uh, throughout this weekend, uh, at least within the WWE for WrestleMania weekend, uh, and that's uh, everything felt a little bit long. So, um, so look, let's jump into WrestleMania, and then we can we can circle around uh, as we go, drive throughout uh, Orlando uh, in the entire weekend, um, and we'll start. Look, we'll start with WrestleMania, and a couple of things that I really want to touch upon, uh, and we'll discuss. Um, but, but right out of the gate, let me give you my impressions of, of WrestleMania 33, uh, from Camping World Stadium in Orlando, Florida, Florida, formerly, uh, the Citrus Bowl. Uh, number one, um, the show is just too goddamn long. Okay. That, that, that's, that's my first, my first impression of WrestleMania 33 is that the show is just way too long. Um, and, and that, that sort of covers everything dealing with WrestleMania. 
show too long. The pre-show goes on the air at 5.30. Okay, for an hour and a half. WrestleMania itself starts at 7 Eastern Standard Time. And then goes for five hours until midnight. So you're talking about six and a half hours of wrestling. Now, granted, we're talking, you know, packages, video packages in between and introductions and all that. But you're you're still talking about six and a half hours in your seat as the show is happening. Not to mention the fact that if you're in Orlando, you're now going to the Citrus Bowl. So you got to get there. So I think we got there about 3 o'clock. It's like 93 degrees outside. Super hot, super crowded. So once again, let's say let's say you were talking about like a 9-hour day going to WrestleMania. That's a long time. Too friggin' long as far as I'm concerned. And I was there. Excited in the moment because, hey. It's WrestleMania Day. As much as I said heading into WrestleMania, I wasn't kind of like, meh. But throughout the weekend and leading up to that day, it started to build. And when I'm there and the stadium's there and all the banners are there and everybody's outside, they're chanting and they're screaming and people got their belts and you're wearing your shirt. Yeah, you're, you're pumped. You're psyched. You're amped up for WrestleMania. But you can't be that for nine hours. It's impossible. So it's just, it's just too long. No one can maintain that level of positive energy for that amount of time. It's impossible. Even if you went in and you were like, yeah, WrestleMania, Super Side, whoa. Within an hour and a half, you were like, ah, I need to go get a water or something because I'm kind of feeling, kind of feeling dehydrated and burnt out a little bit. You just can't do it. There's not enough on the card in matches to keep you at a 10 for nine hours. All right, and let's take nine hours out because I'm talking about just travel time and waiting in line to get into the stadium and going through security and the whole nine. Even if we start at 5.30, you're still talking about six and a half hours. That's still a really long time. You can't be at, at, at 10. You, you, you can't turn up the volume and be at 10 for six and a half hours. You just can't. You start at 10. You, know, you go in and you start at 10. And the first match, the Cruiserweight match between Austin Aries and Neville for the Cruiserweight Championship comes up. And you're pumped because it's the first wrestling you saw. We're kicking this off. It's awesome. You're at a 10. Then the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal comes up next. And maybe you dip down to like an eight. Because nobody cares who's in that match. It's like all the tag teams from SmackDown. And you know, you're rooting for Sami Zayn. And Braun Strowman's there. And that's pretty cool. And this is probably going to be the Big Show's last match. All of these things are happening here. So you go down to like maybe like an eight. You know, and then Modro Wally wins. And you now you're like a like a seven. And then WrestleMania starts and the explosions and the fireworks and that. So you get back up to like a 10. But then you start you start dipping again. You can't stay at a 10 for that long. And I think, especially being in there. I haven't watched the, the broadcast. Because I can't watch six and a half hours of WrestleMania. I lived it. I can't go back and watch six and a half hours of WrestleMania again. I already experienced it. I don't need to do it again. But I th- especially being there, you could sort of feel long stretches where people just didn't have the energy anymore. They just couldn't maintain it. And the WWE, as hard as they tried, could not piece together the puzzle to get the fans amped up all the time. So you would have matches that on paper or even in their build were exciting enough to have you look forward to the match but you just couldn't get there because you were tired it's a long day so you know that that was my 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 first read on wrestlemania 33 is that it's just too long just too long 
And I think where you really started to feel that, and, and, and it's sad, really, was in the main event. The very last match. The very last match to go on was The Undertaker versus Roman Reigns. Which didn't actually start to begin happening until probably about 11.25. Now, The Undertaker's entrance alone is five whole minutes. So, we're getting late into the night. And this is, once again, after now, about six hours of wrestling has happened. There were people there in the Citrus Bowl who were leaving prior to that match. Now, they stayed through Lesnar-Goldberg. They stayed through the two championship matches. They stayed through everything else. They got all the way to 1130 and decided, I got to get out of here. This is... For all intents and purposes, going in, this had all the writing on the wall of being the Undertaker's last match. The retirement match. This was going to be the one that sent the Undertaker off into the sunset. And once again, for all intents and purposes, this was the match that also seemed to have all the signs pointing to it that Roman Reigns would go over the Undertaker. Now, in our heart of hearts... Deep down in there, we would have liked to believe that The Undertaker would finish with only one loss, one blemish on his WrestleMania record throughout his career. And that being against Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 30. Which we can argue one way or the other whether or not it was the right decision or not. But we'd all like to have believed That that was the only one that was ever going to happen. That we were only ever going to witness. That we were only ever going to see that one thing. And so as a result. Yeah we wanted to rally there behind the dead man. In the hopes that he could walk away with his head held high. Having defeated Roman Reigns. Unfortunately, not everybody saw it that way because some people wanted to beat traffic. Why? Because they were already there for six hours and they just they couldn't take it anymore. They had enough. And so here you have this match that was okay. You know, The Undertaker, well, he's, like, he's like 52 years old and he needs a hip replacement. Like he's not at the top of his game anymore. In Roman Reigns... And I'm sure we'll talk about it at length in future episodes. Whilst talented in the ring also needs a balance, a counterpart to make it work. Roman Reigns isn't the guy who carries matches. And I'm not saying that Roman Reigns has been carried in the past. I think Roman Reigns is more than capable of holding his own. In a big match. However, it also depends on who he is matched against. Roman Reigns is not John Cena in that respect. As much as people want to knock John Cena, John Cena rises to the occasion against whoever he is facing. John Cena wasn't carried by Kevin Owens. John Cena wasn't carried by AJ Styles. John Cena rose to the level of athleticism and competition he was faced. And as a result, we got amazing matches from John Cena in the past. Based off of who he was in the ring with. Because on the surface, while John Cena may seem sort of limited, John Cena will never cheat you of your money's worth. When it comes to having a big match. Roman Reigns, I do not believe, is at that level. At least not right now. Roman Reigns is not to the degree where he is... He can carry a match. Roman Reigns can rise to the occasion, yes. Roman Reigns rose to the occasion against AJ Styles. Roman Reigns rose to the occasion against Bray Wyatt. Roman Reigns did some pretty... It was in in the middle of some pretty excellent matches... Last year. 
But with a 52-year-old candidate for a hip replacement, Roman Reigns can't make that match without another half. You know, someone like AJ Styles could wrestle a broomstick and make it look amazing. Roman Reigns doesn't have that. So Roman Reigns needs two to tango. And this wasn't top-notch Undertaker. So as a result, you have a very slow match that isn't very exciting. This isn't Undertaker Shawn Michaels. This isn't Undertaker CM Punk. This isn't Undertaker Triple H. This isn't Undertaker Brock Lesnar. This isn't Undertaker against anybody we've seen him be against in recent years where you knew you were going to get an Undertaker match. This was sort of the Undertaker on his last legs against a guy who, you know, is doing his best with what he's got, but isn't capable of shining it up and making it even more beautiful. So getting to the end of that match and during that match, uh, you know, uh, people leaving, uh, I, I do fault them. You spent all that money and you've been there for six hours. Why leave during the main event? But it felt the send off for the undertaker was less emotional than I would have thought it would have been because of the length of WrestleMania. Because with Roman Reigns defeating The Undertaker in an okay match and having been there for so long and once again not being able to get up and stay at 10 for the entire night, the response to The Undertaker having left was sort of muted than I've seen for other superstars who were then riding off into the sunset. You have to remember, I was also at WrestleMania 24, which was the send-off for Ric Flair in Orlando. That happened in the middle of the card. And that place gave Ric Flair the ovation he deserved sending off into retirement. You look at Shawn Michaels losing to The Undertaker the second time in the retirement match. And watching that, Shawn Michaels was sent off into retirement with the ovation he had earned and that he deserved. Here, people just wanted to go home. In fact, it wasn't until the next night on Monday Night Raw when there was like a 10-minute standing ovation and chant into an empty ring of thank you, Taker, that you really felt that The Undertaker was getting his his due. Remember, this is a staple of the WWE. This is a guy who's been around for a long time, who's adapted, who's morphed, who's changed with the times in order to stay relevant. The Undertaker is one of the last mainstays remaining in the WWE from a bygone era. And even then, a bygone era before the era. The Undertaker stretches back before the Attitude Era. Let's not forget, The Undertaker was fighting Hulkamania once upon a time. It was first introduced by the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase at a Survivor Series. So we're going a ways back with The Undertaker. Paul Bearer used to summon his powers with a magical urn. A supernatural urn. A far departure from where The Undertaker is sort of now. And so watching that response to The Undertaker's retirement, it saddened me a little bit. Even myself, who desperately had to go to the bathroom... Was was kind of I had a sort of one eye on the urinal and one eye on the Undertaker leaving and going up the ramp because it was it was going on it was too long WrestleMania was too long I mean look we cannot say enough about the greatness and the legendary status of the Undertaker. 
I just think that the way that WrestleMania was laid out and the length to which it played did did not was it it was a disservice to a future Hall of Famer and one of the all timers, an all time great in the history of wrestling, The Undertaker. The match itself was okay, nothing special. But everything, but everything leading up to that, it it just it was hard to get us to the right point to send the Undertaker off the right way. I think those uh, in attendance at Monday Night Raw the following night, I think they carried it through, and as a result, I'm I'm proud of that Raw after Mania crowd for at least doing that moment justice. And, you know, and we could talk in the future about where the, sort of The Undertaker stands in the Mount Rushmore of all-timers. But I thought the WrestleMania going just way too long undercut the emotions of what should have been a, a pretty heart-wrenching moment. One that I've seen done better with other superstars Probably on a similar level of The Undertaker. So that's my read on on sort of that. Uh, Match of the night for me. I'll give it to you straight. And this surprised me as I even, as I watched it and admitted to it. Match of the night, Brock Lesnar versus Goldberg. That's right. That's right. I can't even lie about it. I can't even pretend it was something else. I wish it was the Fatal 4-Way elimination match for the Raw Women's Championship. I thought that might have been based off of the the previous year when I thought that the Triple Threat Women's match stole the show. But it wasn't to be. Instead, it was a 4 minute and 41 second Hard-hitting, brutal contest between the Beast Incarnate Brock Lesnar and Goldberg. Now, heading into this match, you have to remember, so you have a lot of people who just don't, who, who didn't want this match to happen. They'd already seen it twice. Goldberg defeats Kevin Owens at Fastlane for the title. They can't believe that Goldberg is going to be heading into WrestleMania as the Universal Champion. Word spreading that basically this is probably it for him. It's going to be, this is it. He extended his run past Survivor Series and this is going to be it. It's just one one more match and then he's out. So sort of you know that Brock Lesnar is going to capture this title and move on as the new champion again. And knowing uh, how short the Survivor Series match was, how quick their interaction at the Royal Rumble was... I had pegged the over-under on this match to be about 87 seconds long. And in fact, I had gone on the radio uh, in WrestleMania weekend and predicted that you should take the under as the safer bet. Not that I would bet my house on it or anything, but that the under for these two individuals seemed like the way to go. Because anything longer than that would be kind of ridiculous. Now, I haven't been since proven wrong. We clocked it. Four minutes and 41 seconds. And I will tell you, it was the first match that occurred during the night where the crowd just really came alive. I mean, they were excited before because it was WrestleMania. I mentioned sort of maintaining that level of being at a 10. And dipping as we went throughout the night. This was the first time where people were able to ratchet it up to like 11. Just just twisted the knob off and got to 11 for Lesnar Goldberg. Had a big fight feel. Felt like a stadium bout. And was able to make it entertaining. For 4 minutes and 41 seconds. Because you're talking about Goldberg hitting spears and jackhammers. You're talking about Brock Lesnar hitting 
10 German suplexes on Goldberg. You're talking about a spear through the barricade. You're talking about high impact, giant physicality between two larger than life gargantuans in the wrestling ring. So the fact that we got less than five minutes of action for this match, and this match was the match of the night, speak volumes to what they were able to do with the time. Because every blow felt fierce. Felt important. Felt like it could be the turning point of the match. And even with Brock Lesnar hitting that F5 and putting Goldberg out and now being the reigning, defending, undisputed Universal Champion, the way that they went about it was exciting. It was exhilarating. You could not get enough of that moment. It was exciting. And while it may not have been as technically sound or as thrilling as some of the other death-defying leaps that, say, Shane McMahon had or Charlotte had, it was hard-hitting action. It was like watching a Tyson fight like a long time ago. Or like a top-notch UFC match where you know that the two guys in there are probably not going to get out of the first round. But somebody, you're going to have a clear and concise winner. That's what you had here. You had a clear and concise winner and you knew that these guys weren't going to get out of the first round. Somebody was going to put the other guy out and that was going to be the end of it. And it was exciting and it was thrilling and that's my match of the night. Hands down, no doubt. Couldn't beat that match. Now, I thought AJ Styles and Shane McMahon as the opener was a pretty solid match. Look, here's the deal with the rest of WrestleMania. I thought there was a lot of solid matches but nothing... Spectacular. You know, going back to sort of the fatal four-way women's match, that match was like a 12-minute match. There's four people in it, and they all get eliminated, and yet that match was underwhelming. Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho, who I thought would put on a spectacular affair after the way they had sort of this hated, intense rivalry leading up, that match, just okay. The title matches. I mean, we already talked about Lesnar and Goldberg, but you, you talk about the Intercontinental match in the pre-show. Dean Ambrose and Baron Corbin. What a snoozer that was. And then you go to the SmackDown end for the, the WWE Championship. Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton. They were more concerned with trying to make uh, creepy visuals occur in the ring, which then did have no impact or effect on the match. And the match itself was just okay. I mean, WrestleMania this year had some moments. I think the return of the Hardy Boys. Slightly damaged, not fully broken. Was really the other high point of the night. Outside of Lesnar and Goldberg. I would even put that, the Hardy Boys surprise return above The Undertaker's retirement for the night. I think it got the most excitement. The crowd once again really woke up when that music hit and the Hardys hit the never-ending ramp to the ring. I thought it was an okay WrestleMania. Okay? I thought the way that the matches were booked were was sort of uh, head-scratching. Uh, the finishes were really anticlimactic. They seemed to be very abrupt and sudden. A point to that women's match with Bailey dropping a Macho Man elbow on Charlotte and then just getting a three-count and it being over. 
it just felt like an off WrestleMania. If you, other than the, those three things, really, okay, other than the Hardys return, the Undertaker retiring, and the and uh, and the Brock Lesnar Goldberg match. There's not very much that I remember all that vividly from this WrestleMania. You know, even a match like The Miz and Maurice versus Cena and Nikki Bella, a match heading into WrestleMania that on paper would have looked like garbage, but through their build seemed to be straight fire going into Orlando. The match itself, eh. The thing people will talk about most is the proposal afterwards. But the match itself was the Miz sort of beating down John Cena, a comeback happening, and the match was over. Like, there was nothing really to write home about about that match. And that's what you could say for so many matches on the card at WrestleMania 33. Uh, nothing to really write home about. Hardy showing up, yes. Goldberg and Lesnar, yes. Undertaker retiring, yes. Everything else, I think if you were to look at Raw and SmackDown the previous the the uh, the following two nights afterwards, where you got the debut of the revival, the return of Finn Balor, the debut of Shinsuke Nakamura, Ty Dillinger showing up, those were more memorable moments in the grand scheme of things, and as they happened, then I think a lot of what we saw at WrestleMania. And maybe it's the hype of WrestleMania. Maybe WrestleMania was overhyped this year. You know, maybe we put two two great expectations on WrestleMania and what it was going to be. I mean, think about it. We were all imagining what Shane McMahon might leap off of in his match against AJ Styles. And then, eh, I mean, he did a shooting star press, which is very cool. Put himself through uh, the announce table ringside, which, you know, is sort of standard fare at this point. But... I think maybe we had drummed up in our head what WrestleMania was going to be. And it was going to be hard for them to live up to expectations. I bet you if I went back and I watched all six and a half hours of this WrestleMania, I would say, nah, it's not a bad card. It's not bad. But I remember in the moment, the way it was booked, the way the abrupt matches, the way the matches ended abruptly and sort of anticlimactically, other than really those three moments that I could point to, The Undertaker, The Hardys, Goldberg Lesnar. Um, not a huge fan of this year's WrestleMania. And once again, really goes back to how long it was. I remember at one point just losing track of how many matches there were. I had a friend who was a few rows back and I sent him a text and I was like, how many matches are left? He's like, I think like four. I mean, there was so much going on, we couldn't even remember or keep track of everything that was happening. So, um, yeah, this year's WrestleMania gets a bit of a, a thumbs down for me. Uh, not, not a huge fan of it. I think there's some really cool stuff to come out of it. But by and large, beginning to end, uh, it just was not, um, just was not all that satisfied with what, came about from WrestleMania 33. And moving forward ahead, like I mentioned, Ty Dillinger, The Revival, Shinsuke Nakamura, Finn Balor, four big players onto the landscape. We'll talk about that more probably next week and where they're going to go. But uh, the Nakamura entrance on SmackDown and Balor's return on Raw, I thought those were huge. And um, and we'll see. We'll see what, what the plan is, especially moving ahead with the Superstar Shake-Up. Um, but, but I thought... Those moments themselves were were sort of bigger than some of the things that happened on the bigger stage at WrestleMania on Sunday. Now, I want to do I do want to talk about NXT Takeover Orlando because for me, I actually thought that was a better card, or at least a better executed card uh, than what we got at WrestleMania. I mean, granted, there's only a few matches, and they do it in a more concise amount of time so you're talking about maybe you know two and a half hours or so to get through all their matches um but you also had the match of the night or the match of the weekend um leaving sort of the young bucks hardy's 
match at uh, Supercard of Honor uh, on on Saturday night, which went head to head against um, Takeover. Th- that that I haven't seen in its entirety, so I, I I'm not gonna I don't want to like knock it or 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 leave it out of the running. I'm just saying based off of what I've seen uh, from being mostly exposed to WrestleMania events uh, through WrestleMania weekend, um, I thought the triple threat tag match at NXT Takeover Orlando was the match of the weekend. With the Authors of the Pain versus uh, DIY versus the Revival, uh, the Authors of Pain really were put over as monsters in that match, and you know uh, they're they're still two guys who are limited in what it is they can do, but they also don't need to be involved in technical wrestling. Um, the fact that they were engaged in a triple threat with DIY and the Revival, who was able to do most of the legwork on that front, allowing the Authors of Pain to then be these humongous destructive forces, I thought that really did a lot for the Authors of Pain moving forward. And it was, look, that was a match that was superbly exciting um, and well booked. I mean, just well thought out. The idea that DIY and The Revival, who hate each other, hate each other, who have a long history with each other in recent months, involving injury and title changes and everything, have to work together to try and defeat this force to be reckoned with is just really good storytelling I mean it's just really good storytelling that was the match of the night and the match of the weekend now over on NXT the NXT front I thought it was more for moving forward uh, remember three titles on the line none of them changed hands but Amber Moon versus Asuka was set up really to move that feud forward with Asuka much more as a clear cut heel in establishing Ember Moon is a sympathetic baby face to the NXT universe. So I thought in that respect, uh, that accomplished what it needed to. Uh, the tag match, uh, like I said, was uh, just, just that had you up at a 10 um, throughout the entire night. So that, that one was stellar. Uh, the main event, I mean, that was to once again sort of establish Bobby Roode as your NXT champion and set Shinsuke Nakamura out into the, the wild. For him to land on SmackDown Live on Tuesday night. Look, I, I'm not... Having seen Bobby Roode in the past few months... I, I'm not a huge Bobby Roode fan... Uh, in in what I've seen so far in NXT. And, and part of it may be... The, the feuds he's been set up with. Particularly here... Against Shinsuke and Nakamura. I don't think their styles really lend... To each other. To have a, a phenomenal... Main event. I think Nakamura can go with... The right style. I don't think Bobby Roode is that. And as a result, I think... And plus, look. After the tag match, which is in the middle. The women's match, which followed. And then the men's match, which followed that. We're going to be tough to, to, once again, top. What we got in that lengthy triple threat tag match. But um, I, I thought more... What NXT TakeOver did. And, and look, by and large, the match... The, 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 the opening brawl with Sanity versus uh, Ty Dillinger's team... Um, and then even the debut of Alistair Black, I think really what NXT TakeOver Orlando did was helped move NXT forward a little bit. Helped them pivot from where they were to now where they're going. Helped them turn the corner a little bit to what they're going to be doing over the next six months and sort of moving away from the Revival and Nakamura and moving forward with the Authors of Pain and Bobby Roode and Drew McIntyre now on the scene and further establishing Ember Moon and seeing what who's going to ultimately stop Asuka. They've now sort of set the tone for what it's going to be moving forward. I think that's why we didn't see any title changes is because most of the people competing either were in the midst of getting to that next level or already past the next net level and being able to be sent on their way to the main roster. Um, but I, I thought overall 
especially I think due to the length and the overall intensity of the matches, uh, Takeover for me was a better show over the course of the weekend than WrestleMania. Um, once again, it's tight, it's quick, it hits you where it needs to, and it gets on with it. Um, whereas WrestleMania is just like I said, uh, just too long, just too long. So, um, so once again, a match of the night there, and probably the match of the weekend, uh, easily that triple threat match, uh, DIY versus the Authors of Pain versus. Uh, the Revival, who I wish well on Monday Night Raw. Um, and then on, on WrestleMania 33, uh, my three big moments were Lesnar Goldberg, the return of the Hardys, and the retirement of The Undertaker. Uh, one quick note here to, to bring up, since I said I was talking about the Hall of Fame. Uh, this is now the second year in a row I have not gone to the WWE Hall of Fame. Um, and uh, part of it is uh, I just don't want to anymore. Um, <laughs> I have... I have found that the Hall of Fame is, going back to the theme of WrestleMania here, uh, just too long. Just way too long. Um, And this year was no different. Uh, We were set to sort of meet up with people and go out and have a good time at at, uh, Friday night. And and let's not remember, Hall of Fame used to be on Saturday night and now been moved up to Friday. Um, And it could not happen because people were still trapped inside of the Hall of Fame. Number one, they just induct way too many people. Which is way too many people. So you have speeches from the people who are inducting them. And then as well as the people who are getting inducted. And it's just way too many people. Because nobody wants to tell them to stop. Because this is their moment. And seeing and hearing their stories is great. Except I don't need to sit in an arena to watch it. Like an uncomfortable arena chair for five hours to watch it. Not really my cup of tea. I would much rather watch it on the network. On the comfort of my house. Uh, on the couch. Um, later, and and go it from there. So I did not attend the Hall of Fame this year. Uh, I don't know that I'll attend the Hall of Fame in future years. Uh, I do like listening to these guys' stories. I do think it's great that they have their moments. I just don't want to sit in an arena for many hours and watch it unfold. So uh, I did not go this year, but uh, my hat's off to Kurt Angle, who... A well-deserving recipient, uh, recipient and uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see him now as a part of Monday Night Raw. We'll discuss that in future episodes, I'm sure, as this unfolds more about the role of Kurt Angle and what he brings to the equation, uh, sort of a freshness that we've seen uh, just by him being there for one episode. Um, but then overall, look there's, look, there's a lot of wrestling that goes on during WrestleMania weekend, I cannot attend at all. Lots of people do, and and there's something out there for everyone. Uh, whether it's the WWN Super Show or some Shimmer, uh, uh, Kaiju Big Battle, there's tons of stuff out there for anyone who wants any part of what's going on uh, during WrestleMania weekend. So if you can't, if you can't go. Uh, you're you're selling yourself short, man. Uh, save save your pennies. Next year's in New Orleans, which for me, uh, WrestleMania 30 was the best WrestleMania experience I've ever had. So uh, I, I strongly suggest you make your way out there. Um, and look, you, you can go to WrestleCon and and meet people, uh, meet meet wrestlers of of past and present, as well as the fans. Like that's that's really what inspired me to get back on here, meeting people out at Access, hanging out with them, sort of getting just that infectious love of wrestling running back through my veins to get the IWC back up and running. So I want to thank everybody that I've ran into over the course of the weekend. I want to thank everybody that's tuned in to listen here now. I want to thank all the people who checked out my, who flooded my Instagram uh, as I just poured just WrestleMania pictures upon WrestleMania pictures upon WrestleMania pictures on there. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it, it was a great weekend. Uh, I'm glad to be back here on the air. I'm glad to be talking about wrestling. Uh, this was fun. I like this. So we'll do it again. We'll be back to do it again next week. I promise you, we're going to do We're going to make it happen. So look, make sure you check us out. However you get us, however you get podcasts, uh, we'll get them all reset up here. So iTunes, Stitcher, uh, the whole nine, wherever you get a podcast, uh, we'll make sure that uh, Intelligent Wrestling Conversation is there for you to subscribe, uh, comment, like, the whole nine. Uh, just make sure you follow us there and uh, and get it out to, to the world. Um, and, and look, and follow me on social media, okay, on Twitter, at InfamousKid, that's K-I-D-D, or you can follow me on Facebook, facebook.com slash BillyTheKid, and we'll get all those updates for you uh, as soon as everything is set up with iTunes, Stitcher, and the whole nine for you to take care of that. So, look, uh, I want to thank you for tuning in on this first episode. 
Um, let's keep going strong. Let's keep that love of wrestling going. And once again, uh, the IWC, as you know it, moving forward, going to be a different animal than it was in the past. Whole different kind of show. And uh, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how long we can ride out this wave of, uh, of passion and love and excitement and enthusiasm. I've been your host, Billy Donnelly. This has been Intelligent Wrestling Conversation. I'll be back next week. So um, I hope you will too. Peace. <laughs> Intelligent Wrestling Conversation has been a podcast presentation of This Is Infamous.